Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 322 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Michael Bishop. He's the author of over a dozen novels, including Brittle Innings, Unicorn Mountain, Philip K. Dick is Dead, Alas, and No Enemy But Time, and numerous short story collections, including Blooded on Arachne and The Door Gunner and Other Perilous Flights of Fancy. And we'll be speaking with him today about his recent short story collections, The Sacerdotal Owl and Three Other Long Tales, and Other Arms Reach Out to Me, Georgia Stories. And now, here's our interview with Michael Bishop. All right, so we're here with Michael Bishop. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Okay, so your new book is called The Sacerdotal Owl and Three Other Long Tales. So how'd this book come about? Well, it came about over a long period of time. If you look at the uh, acknowledgments page, you'll see that these four stories were written over a considerable period. Um, the Sacerdotal Owl is one of the newer ones, for me at least. It, it appeared in the early aughts in 2002 or 2003, rather. Uh, but the oldest story here goes all the way back to 1976. It was the second book I published, as a matter of fact, and it stood on its own. Uh, it was a short novel published by Harper and Rowe, and I was extremely excited to uh, to have the, that particular book come out because it was my first hardcover, for one thing. Uh, I had previously been published by Ballantyne. Uh, with a novel called The Funeral for the Eyes of Fire, which was straight out uh, science fiction, anthropological science fiction. And so uh, I felt like, wow, I have it made. I've been published in hardcover by Harper and Rowe. Uh, but uh, uh, the story has had, you know, a couple of other incarnations. But I knew that I wanted to, uh, I, I knew I wanted to revisit it and uh, revise it a little bit, which is something that I've been doing as kind of a personal program to all of my all of my uh, novels. Uh, but the Sacerdotal Owl seemed to me to be the story that should lead it off, primarily because. Uh, it has not appeared in any other collection before. Uh, it had two magazine appearances. Uh, well, actually, a hardcover anthology uh, appearance in a book called Thirteen Horrors that Brian Hopkins uh, edited. He, he solicited the story to honor uh, the guests of honor at uh, each of the horror conventions that had been over that period of time. And so I wrote the story pretty much uh, at uh, his prompting. And uh, it, it then had a subsequent appearance in Weird Tales when George Sithers and Daryl Schweitzer were editing that magazine. And I'd never had a story in uh, Weird Tales before, so that was exciting for me. And Jeffrey Ford saw the story there and liked it very much. But I've never put it in a collection before. And... Uh, this this opportunity came about because I needed to do a new book for Fairwood Press and my uh, imprint there, Kudzu Planet Productions. And I thought, well, why not lead off with a story that's never been collected before and put it uh, and uh, connect it to three other long tales. And one of them was my second novel, even though it's a short novel, and the other two were novellas. Yeah, I think that's interesting. The story you mentioned, uh, and strange at Ekbaton the Trees, was originally published as a novel, and now it's uh, one of four in this book. Right, right. Well, you see, we were doing my novels one by one, really. Uh, novels that were out of print that I was revising and putting back into print with Patrick Swenson at uh, Fairwood Press, and, and an imprint that he uh, allowed me to have there, that he allows me to have there uh, for my own work. Uh, and I was thinking it, that if we did and Strange at Ekben Hand the Trees, it would be an awfully short book in comparison to the others. And also people had probably seen it before in other places. So I thought that uh, uh, combining it with uh, three other tales, especially one that most people had not seen before, would be a good way to uh, to present it to, to a new public. Well, it's somewhat unusual to have books of novellas, these sort of longer stories. And you say in some of the notes that you really like these, this this length, the, the long story, oh, yeah. the short novel. I can remember, uh, you know, picking up a, a book of uh, uh, Roger Zelazny's uh, long stories, as a matter of fact. Uh, I can't even remember the title of it now. I've it's got it in the four back for tomorrow. here in my notes. 
for for tomorrow. Yeah, that was the title, a very simple title. And it had one of my favorite stories of his, which was the one about uh, Mars, a rose for Ecclesiastes. And I love that particular story. Uh, And I like the other stories in the book as well. That was probably my favorite, and it introduced me to his work. And one interesting thing that came out of that was that uh, very early in my career, uh, he took a look at my third published novel and, and was kind enough to uh, to give it a publicity comment. And so I felt like at that point I was kind of off and running. Oh, that's yeah. You know, he's my favorite author, so that's interesting to hear. Have, did you uh, interact with him um, at conventions and stuff like that? Well, you know, not very often because I didn't attend very many conventions, and I still don't. I, I do upon occasion, but 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 rarely, to be honest. But there was one convention, I believe it was. Um, uh, the Conference on the Fantastic in the Arts. I think he was at that one year. And I was there, and I met him, and uh, uh, I really was kind of wandering around in a daze, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And he invited me to a dinner uh, that he was giving for several of his writer friends there and uh, uh, pretty much you know, paid for it and everything. And I felt like uh, he was just awfully kind. That's the one thing I do remember about him, in addition to his work, that he was an extremely kind man. That's you know I I I mentioned in my email that I met you at ICFA I think in 1997 and so you were actually one of the first authors that I talked to at any length and um, and and you you've always stood out in my mind as one of the nicest people I ever met at a uh, you know at a science convention. That's kind. I think we've had a number of people in our field you know whom uh, one can look at as. Kind of models of how to comport oneself at those at those uh, gatherings, but uh, you can also have a lot of fun at them too. I shouldn't <laughs> I, I shouldn't indicate that everybody is being you know all goody goody at these things, but uh, uh, it, it's fun to get to meet the people. Mm-hmm. And it's just uh, if you don't go to that many, I, I feel lucky that I, I caught you when I did. So, well, I'm glad you did, then. I really am. Um, but so talking about novellas, I mean, because I really love I've, I've been saying for years and years that I think that novels are too long and I really like shorter pieces. And I've, I've heard a lot of people say that they think that the novella is the perfect length for a, a fantasy and science fiction story. Right. I mean, I, I think a lot of people feel that and believe that. I know that when I first started writing, I couldn't imagine writing a novel. That was one thing. I, I, it just seemed to me, how do people you know, stay with a project that long and actually complete it? And the answer, of course, is they do it page by page, step by step, just as you get through any long project, whatever it happens to be, or any long journey. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I, I wanted to write, so I wrote short stories, and I found myself writing short stories that gradually grew longer as, I, as my career progressed. And so ultimately, I found that I was writing novellas, and one of the first ones I wrote was a, a, a long one called uh, The White Otters of Childhood, which appeared in fantasy and science fiction. And I had another one that David uh, Gerald um, kind of solicited from me for an anthology that he uh, had. And I'm trying to think now, I think it was called Proto Stars. Uh, but that was a, a novella called On the Street of the Serpents. And I found, you know, that this was a, a, a link that seemed congenial to me that I enjoyed writing in. Uh, and over the years, I've written any number of novellas, and they have done uh, well for me. It seems to me that uh, Gardner Dozois, in particular, would would pick up uh, these novellas and reprint them. Terry Carr picked up one called Old Folks at Home that was a part of my uh, fix-up uh, catacomb years about the ur- an urban nucleus series of stories. So uh, it was a good uh, a good feeling to know that uh, I could stretch to that length. And ultimately, from there, I did go to novel length. Well, so why don't you tell us about In Strange at Ekbaton de Trees? How did that one come about? Well, as I think I stated in the uh, in the afterward to the book, I was really under the influence of Ursula Le Guin at that particular period. I loved uh, The Left Hand of Darkness in particular, but I also looked at her earlier ecumen novels. There were three, I think, in particular, and uh, uh, 
And I thought, well, maybe I can. Uh, and, and in fact, I would say that and Strange at Ekbatan, the Trees, was the novella that worked me into novel length. And, and it's right on the borderline between the two, I would say. And perhaps in this book, it, it's, it's a, a novella at the longer end of whatever uh, <laughs> the length is supposed to be, because I cut it back from its original version, uh, Harper and Rowe version, because I felt that there were a couple of scenes in it that were extraneous even to it. Uh, and uh, also I tightened up some of the scenes in it. And that's a project, as I say, that I've been embarked upon ever since uh, 2010 or 11 when I hooked up with uh, Patrick Swenson to, to really get my books back into print. And I wanted to make sure that they came back in versions that I could be proud of no matter how long they were out there. I mean, I've never read any previous incarnations of this, but I, I thought this was terrific, this story. Um, do you want to just I'm, talk I'm, about I'm the, so glad. Uh, the, the the premise of it? Just sort of what lay, just sort of lay out the the storyline. Well, the storyline was, uh, I suppose that in some ways it was inspired not only by Ursula Le Guin, but from the poem by Archibald MacLeish that uh, that I use I use a line from as the title. And strange at Ecbatan, the trees take leaf by leaf the evening strange, and that's from a long poem of MacLeish's called. Uh, you, Andrew Marvel, which is playing off uh, to his coy mistress in the long expanse of time uh, that that poem alludes to. Uh, and uh, the thing that's different in, in uh, McLeish's poem is that it's not about a young man attempting to persuade his uh, love to go to bed with him. It's about a person contemplating the lengths of time that we human beings spend here on Earth and how short they are, and especially how short are even the empires that arise over time and, and then fall. And so that was uh, an idea that was at the back of my mind when I started writing in Strange at Ecbatan, the trees, because uh, in this particular story, which is set you know, some 12,000 years in the future on another planet, uh, this society, which is in many ways a, a kind of uh, early technological society in between, caught between uh, the, the medieval and the new, and they're undergoing a series of real stresses, and one of those stresses is uh, a, a, an alien invasion, not aliens from another planet, but aliens on their own world, a group of people who are their enemies. Uh, another uh, particular um, what challenge that they face is this uh, recurrent, but at long intervals, uh, appearance of a creature called the Sloke at the bottom of the seas, and uh, it can, over time, extend itself and come upon the land itself and cause all sorts of havoc. Uh, and some people believe that it's a myth because they haven't lived long enough to, to see it, and they can't really believe what others have said about it. So we have this uh, invasion from uh, uh, people from across the sea, the Pelagans, uh, and we also have the idea that the Sloke is going to concurrently with this invasion itself invade. And then there is the concern that the society is breaking down from within. And uh, one of the major characters in the story, um, Gabriel Elk, who runs this neuro theater, uh, is maybe at the center of that particular problem because he is attempting to resurrect the human emotions that have been suspended suppressed uh, in his people by uh, a genetic program to modify them, not by them themselves, but by their ancestors from Earth. And all of these things are going on at once. And I tried to bring them into a kind of flamboyant romantic tale with uh, uh, a kind of edge of melancholy to it. And uh, that was what I was working at in this early story. So it was pretty ambitious, but I didn't want it to be so ambitious that I couldn't handle it. Uh, and so I, I think the novella uh, length worked very well for me in that case. I think the genetic engineering of the society is really interesting because the, the, the powers that place them on this planet have decided that they've they've genetically engineered most people to not have human emotions like aggression and fear and things like that. But then they feel yeah. like a population entirely of people like that would not be able to get anywhere. So there's this sort of ruling class of people who still do have emotions. 
uh-huh. like the Adorites, I call them, and I think that has some kind of, uh, of uh, analog in in, uh, in Middle Eastern uh, history. Uh, the Adorites were the were the class, but yes, and Gabriel Elk belongs to that class, but he feels for the people who are uh, the people of the hand, uh, and. Uh, and at the same time, he wants to he wants to tend to them, but and he does not want to uh, uh, go to war again. But they do have to go to war to uh, to preserve themselves. I mean, is there anything more you could say about how you came up with that idea of those that two class society, or is that a, a workable? Well, you know, when you go back, if you go all the way back to the time machine by H. G. Wells, you've got the Morlocks and uh, who are the others in the there? LOI? Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. And I think that was at the back of my mind to some extent, you know. But I wanted I wanted something different, but I wanted there to be these two different aspects in in the time machine. You've got the really brutal aspect and uh um uh, and the Morlocks and the gentle aspect in the say it again for me. LOI. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, I can see the word, but I'm not getting it out. Anyway, you know, that was, I'm sure that was at the back of my mind, too, because I was a great H.G. Wells uh, reader early on. And uh, probably um, if you go past Ursula Le Guin to, and Ray Bradbury, you'll get back finally to H.G. Wells somewhere along the line. And these people, too, they've been genetically engineered to not pursue advanced technology too much, which I thought was interesting. Right. In fact, uh, I make a comment in the, the afterward that uh, it's a strange society. I mean, they have these technological advances, but they uh, but they don't seem to extend to their transportation. You know, they 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 have sailing ships and they have horses, uh, but they also have electricity and they have uh, uh, weapons, and uh, and of course they bring out the the weapons in order to defeat uh, the Pelagans in in this particular story. But yeah, and it reminded me very much of my reading Mary Shelley's novel, uh, The Last Man, uh, which does deal with the last of humanity. But it it even goes into the 20th century, however, and you find that they're still fighting wars, but they're doing them all on horseback because that was not something that Mary Shelley uh, could get past. She couldn't uh, envision past her own time. And uh or she didn't. I won't say she couldn't, but she did not envision very far past her own time in that particular instance. Well, I just feel like with a lot of a lot of times in fantasy and science fiction, authors want to put in all their favorite things, and so you know, going back <laughs> even to Edgar Rice Burroughs or something, you, the the genre is full of stories of swords and laser guns together, and probably doesn't make sense, but it's uh, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Right. Right. And yet, you know, you want, I think, at the same time to say something serious about humanity. You don't want it to simply be a complete escape. And and I think that that's been one thing that's motivated me to write as much science fiction as I have, because there seems to be permission to do that, permission to uh, deal with serious uh, subjects, even though you want the books to appear on on book racks and bus stations and <laughs> and uh, grocery stores and what have you, you would like to reach a popular public, but at the same time, you don't want to be considered sim- simply a, a kind of glorified comic book. Although nowadays, uh, I can understand that uh, uh, you know a glorified comic book can be a wonderful thing itself. Well, there does seem to be this tension throughout your career of the the warring impulses of the the literary versus the 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 love of fantasy and science fiction, and you can even see this with the the title and Strange at Ecbatan the Trees. You say there was sort of a there's sort of wrangling oh, over yes. this title. Well, when Donner Wolheim bought uh, bought the paperback rights from uh, from us and from. Uh, uh, the book had first appeared, as I say, from Harper and Rowe. He didn't want the title on on the book, and so I was ready for him. Uh, I, I had uh, uh, Beneath the Shattered Moons, which you know echoes uh, uh, Under the Moons of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, and he was happy with that. Uh, and so that was what we uh, put on the paperback edition of the book. And I wasn't unhappy with that, although I I knew that if I ever did the story again, I would go back to my original title. I mean, do you think he was right that some readers just look at that title and are just baffled and I don't think, read the book? Yeah, I, th- 
I, I think it's not necessarily that they would be uh, turned off by it so much as they would simply look at it and say, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, and, and I understand that. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that uh, there's there's room. And maybe that's why I, you know, I kind of buried that story in uh, the sacerdotal <laughs> owl. I don't know whether the sacerdotal owl is any more uh, uh, what – open to uh, immediate understanding than, than in Strange at Ecbatan, the trees. But at least you can see the cover. You know, you can pick it up and see this Mayan image and, and an owl landing on top of a box with the title of the story in it. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that's something else there, too. You mentioned that this story was inspired partly by your admiration for Ursula K. Le Guin, and you say in one of the notes that you say, to the dismay of some of my writer friends and the satisfaction of others, to this day I revere Le Guin as a significant influence. I was just curious, why why is there dismay from some of your writer Well, you know, I cut that out. of you, you, You've got the advanced reading copy, I think, and I cut that out because I felt like it was kind of – it would, would puzzle people. And, but I know that there are some writers who, who uh, think that she's a little too literary, and I've never thought that. I, I mean, I recognize that she has the respect of the literary establishment as well as that of the science fiction establishment, but uh, I have never felt uh, that uh, uh, she should be looked down our noses at because she uh, she reads stuff other than science fiction and fantasy. I, I think it's necessary to read stuff other than science fiction and fantasy. That's interesting because I, I feel like I hear pretty much universal praise for Ursula Le Guin. Maybe that's – maybe um, in previous decades maybe was there more of that sentiment floating around? Well, I mean, you know, if you go back to the 60s, uh, uh, I, I think everybody liked science fiction or many of the science fiction readers liked science fiction because it wasn't uh, literary. It was uh, meant to grab you by the ears and pull you into some kind of uh, astonishing adventure. Uh, or experience. And, and what's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. And one of the things I like about Ursula Le Guin is she always said, you cannot judge a book, and she's not going to say by its cover, but she would say by its genre. What you have to judge the book by is, by, is its quality. How well does it do what it does? And uh, I, I like the fact that uh, she never stepped away from science fiction or, or uh, uh, divorced herself from it in any way, shape, or form. In fact, she rebuked writers who did that, and I always admired her for that. Uh, and I think maybe I might have a tendency to do that in some instances, but I've struggled with that. You mentioned uh, that there's always this tension between high and low art and, and my concerns. And one of my books, Count Geiger's Blues, is about that. It's about uh, an editor at a newspaper who, you know, who is their arts editor and who is something of a snob. But he undergoes an experience that actually changes him. You know, he's exposed to uh, discarded uh, radiation in a pool and uh, goes swimming in it. And suddenly he has superpowers and he has become that which he despises. <laughs> and so the rest of Count Geiger's Blues is about that very thing, that very subject. And I call the book a comedy because I think it has some really funny sides to it. But the serious element of the book is that ultimately uh, – most of us don't re recognize that in, in the 1950s in particular, uh, nuclear power was considered to be a, a, a real mystery. I mean, it was supposed to save us and then it was supposed to destroy us at the same time. But if you're exposed to radiation, you aren't going to become a superman. You're going to die. <laughs> And so the book uh, focuses on that in its last chapters, even though I think it's a funny book. And he comes to understand that uh, what you look for in a work is quality. And the quality is not inherent in the genre. It's inherent in how well one uh, executes what one is attempting to do. That's interesting. It's, it's always sort of struck me that People who read literary fiction oftentimes seem to have this attitude, this very delimited idea of what could possibly happen to them, um, you know, mm -hmm. and this idea that, uh, you know, you could you could get on an airplane and it could get hijacked and suddenly you're in a thriller, you know, and yeah, I, right. I didn't think this could happen in my life. You know, this is what is this genre element doing in my ordinary life? Sure, sure. Uh, but again, you know, I, I um 
Oh, I don't know what I'm trying to say here at this point. It's just that I do uh, appreciate the fact that I was able to uh, develop a career in a field uh, that uh, at one time was not considered to be reputable. I mean, you know, it really was not. And I think that in the early 60s or mid-60s, it seemed to me that there were writers coming along like Ursula Le Guin and Robert Silverberg and others who were approaching it with a degree of seriousness that it had not seen before. Uh, and that bothered some people. And you had the new wave and you had uh, new worlds in England and, and the writers there. Uh, and so there was some real churning going on in the genre at that time. And there were some conflicts within the field. Uh, and it feel, felt to me as if, you know, that was all really good. That was wonderful because one of the things that I think fantasy and science fiction does really well is it takes different elements and puts them in the same package and blends them together in ways that have entirely new flavors, entirely new tastes, rather than staying within one pattern solely. And I think that's what's happened to us today. Uh, and, and I think that's a good thing. In one interview I read, you talked about Ed Strange and Ekbaton, the trees coming out of the, quote, supercharged 1970s milieu. And I was just curious, what do you mean by supercharged? And are we still in a supercharged milieu? <laughs> you know, I don't remember saying that. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. I think we are. I think we're in a supercharged milieu today to the extent that I'm having a hard time keeping up with it. You know, we're having uh, people coming in from uh, different cultures, different ethnicities, different societies, and they're bringing their own vision and their own way of looking at things. Uh, and I think some people are just mind boggled by it to the extent that they recoil a little bit rather than embrace it because it's all so different and so new. But I also think it's also rejuvenating in a way that uh, we have to we have to embrace ultimately i mean but you've been writing about you've been using elements of other cultures for a long time right i mean both oh, yeah. the, the sacerdotal owl and um the land of snow um right do right. that very explicitly well <laughs> Yeah, and I think I've been interested in these in these cultures too. You, you might need to know that when I grew up, I was an Air Force brat, and uh, we didn't stay very long in one place. And I started school in Tokyo, Japan, uh, as a kindergartner at Yoyogi Elementary School, where the cherry blossoms bloom. And I finished high school in Seville, Spain. Uh, actually in an American enclave. I lived in Seville itself. I was one of the few students who actually lived on the economy uh, with my with my dad and his wife at that time. But we were, I went to school in Santa Clara, which was uh, an American enclave south of Seville. And, uh, um, and so I was exposed to the Japanese culture as a very young person. I've always been fascinated by it. And then I was exposed to, uh, well, living in a, uh, a city, an ancient city, as far as most American cities go, uh, of Sevilla. Uh, I could go up to the top of our apartment building and see the tower uh, of the largest cathedral in town. La Geralda was the tower. And I could see it from the top of my apartment building there. It was just three stories, but that tower was over the entire city. So I've always been interested in, in other cultures. I, I learned that city almost uh, I could navigate my way through that city like a native by the time I left there, and people were astonished by that, and I could speak the language almost as a native, although I'm sad to say I've lost a lot of that ability over the years. I'm curious, do, do you, when you go to write a story like this, did you already know a lot about Buddhism or the Mayan religion from the sacerdotal owl, or do you have to... Like how much research do you need to do for for a story? I did a good bit of re. I'll, I'll I'll confess I did a good bit of research for the sacerdotal owl. Uh, for one thing, uh, I, I have never been to uh, South America. I've never been to Central America, so there was no way I could do it without doing some research. And I did a good bit of research. In fact, when I read the story for the galleys in this. Uh, I was really surprised at what I appeared to know. <laughs> and and I think that that happens when you immerse yourself in something. But I really did immerse myself in, in the background material for this. Uh, 
And I also had in mind um, uh, the fact that uh, I admired a lot of the work of Lucius Shepard, and of course he said a lot of his stories in South America, or well, in Central America, I would say probably uh, more so than than not. But uh, uh, but I wanted to do something that uh, uh, he would find interesting, and I'm not sure whether he did or not, to tell you the truth. But uh, 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 I don't think I wrote a uh, a Lucius Shepard story. But I think I did uh, kind of end up in his territory for a while. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with these belief systems that you're referencing in these stories. But so I, I, I felt like I learned a bunch from reading them. Um, for example, you, you talk about the Tibetan belief in monkey ancestors puts them in a unique category as the only people who acknowledge this connection before Darwin. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, well, that was something that uh, I, I happened upon in doing research for it, uh, and I think that was said by uh, an American woman, archaeo- not archaeologist, but anthropologist. Uh, I'm not completely sure right now. I don't have that. Yeah, in front it's of me. Karen Swenson. Oh yeah, right. And I thought that was just as you do. I thought that was incredibly interesting, and. Uh, uh, and also, I, I was paying close attention to what was going on in Tibet for a while, especially with the Chinese doing all they could to, it seemed to me, uh, to, uh, I don't know how to put this, deculturate the place. You know, they were attempting in, in many respects to take over the territory and to uh, uh, to make Buddhism um, a thing of the past, even. I don't think that's going to happen there. Uh but the people do feel uh, somewhat persecuted, and the Chinese government will not acknowledge uh, that that's what they're doing. They're in there to help, whereas the uh, the Tibetans themselves uh, are quite resistant to the change and don't know how to, to, to uh, handle it. That was one of the reasons that I think I, I, I thought about you know, giving them their own land. It's sort of like uh, the Jews finding a, a homeland in Israel. Well, right. So do you want to talk about the story of the Land of Snow? Because you imagine this uh, interstellar voyage for the Tibetans to uh, establish a, a new home on a on an alien planet. Right. And, and I talk in the afterward a little bit about the two points I, that I wanted to deal with. And one of them was, of course, making uh, all of the members of the ship uh, Buddhists or persons uh, who were in sympathy with what they were uh, attempting and what they were about. And the other thing was to uh, make my main character a young woman who grows up during the course of this voyage. And the unusual thing there, and I don't know how much to tell. I imagine it doesn't really matter. But, uh, well, I can, I, can, I can tell this because it's in the title or one of the subtitles to the story. Uh, but I, I wanted, uh, what would happen if the Dalai Lama, who is traveling with them, died? because you have a limited number of people to choose from as your next Dalai Lama. And uh, supposedly that person is reincarnated from the previous uh, Dalai Lama. Uh, and so in any, in any event, I recall that our current Dalai Lama uh, actually said at one point that he believed one day there would be a female Dalai Lama who might not even be Asian and so that was really one of the jumping off places for that story. And so my narrator is a young woman who becomes the Dalai Lama. Yeah, and so I, I thought it was just such an interesting story. And also it's interesting because it was written for a, an anthology called Going Interstellar, which somehow had some cooperation with NASA. Yeah, um, the editors were uh, Les Johnson, who who is a NASA scientist, and Jack McDevitt, who is a good, good friend of mine and who uh, writes what I, what I think are, are wonderful uh, science fiction novels. They're almost all set on other worlds, and they deal with uh, explorations of, of other planets, pasts, archaeology, uh, travel between the planets, that sort of thing. But he has uh, very human characters. And uh, uh, I knew uh, that he probably extended that uh, invitation to me because I'd written another uh, novella about uh, space travel called uh, generation space travel called Cree de Coeur for um, Asimov's back in the 90s, I think. And as a matter of fact, that was one of the stories that Gardner Dozola uh, ex- uh, chose for a best of the year anthology that he edited. And he, of course, chose this story for a best of the year anthology that he edited. I miss Gardner, by the way. 
Uh, and uh, um, but anyway, Jack's involvement with this NASA scientist was something that I was grateful for because, as I have frequently admitted, I don't have a strong science background, although I work hard to overcome that by doing research. And in this particular case, they were kind enough to provide examples of some of the things that are actually uh, on the drawing board uh, for interstellar travel. And I chose uh, a particular version of that travel for, for this story, and it involves well, I have to stop and think about it. That's that's the the honest truth, and I'm going to look at my own. Uh, well, I I could tell uh, you I, I have it here. It's an anti hydrogen fueled starship with 24 drop tanks that it sheds over the course of its interstellar migration. Right, that's exactly it. Thank you. <laughs> and and I'll tell you this: on my previous story, I had uh, Jeffrey Landis. Uh, provide uh, background material for me. And he is a NASA scientist and still is. And uh, I had him in a clarion class uh, in uh, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and uh, we became friends. But he was an enormous help on that particular story and really kind of vetted it for me. And so on this particular time, I went to him and said, could you uh, do a drawing of this particular uh, ship for me? And he did it. And he and uh, it appeared in Going Interstellar, uh, but it does not appear in, in uh, this particular book of the three long tales. We don't have any illustrations in it. Uh, and that was helpful, just having... Uh, having Jeff Landis, a NASA scientist, on board to help me with stories that were uh, solicited by a NASA scientist and one of our best science fiction writers. Yeah, it would be nice, it seems like, if that sort of resource were online or something for all the, you know, all the interstellar spaceship configurations that are seriously being proposed and, and writers could uh, could refer to that. Right. You know, I'm not sure that you, you couldn't find something like that if you looked. Um, I haven't looked myself, so I, I couldn't say for certain. But I do know this. Jack himself gets in touch with scientists and and asks them if they could help him out, you know, give him some information. And uh, once he has done that, he's developed friendships with many of them. I think that's how he and Les Johnson came to edit an anthology together. But he's extremely good about going to the sources. And very often he says they're extremely happy to, to help you. Uh, uh, especially if they think your book is going to be published and they're going to get an acknowledgement somewhere <laughs> in it. But even even in other instances, they'll just do it out of the goodness of their hearts if they're not absolutely uh, inundated with work. And so then did you look at that diagram that Jeff Landis drew and you thought, oh, well, this section will be the people in suspended animation and this section will be the workers and this section will be the, the religious figures? <laughs> I did. I, I thought about, uh, I divided it up into different sections. I can't remember what they were now. I'd have to read the story again. I'm what I called them, I mean. And uh, and I had to imagine that they were that this ship was going to be large. It was not going to be tiny. It was going to be incredibly large. And that there was going to be a lot of room for uh, for these different uh, pockets of, of Buddhists who have different uh, specific jobs to perform uh, and different things to do in the society itself. They may be monks. They may be, uh, you know, what, pilots. They may be all of these different things that you would have to have on a society as large as that, people growing crops and, and hydroponics and all of these things. So I just had to imagine that it would be possible to get all of these different uh, uh, small societies into this you know, huge spaceship traveling towards a distant destination. Uh, and that was a, a, a kind of a problem for me, too, sometimes, because envisioning how they all fit together is difficult upon occasion. And if you have trouble envisioning, envisioning it, it's going to be difficult, I think, for the reader to envision it as well. So you do have to work at it a little bit. I thought it was interesting that the ship is fragile enough that it's going to take 30 years or something to decelerate. Um, was that driven by the science or was that driven by the exigency? No, that wasn't driven by the plot of the story. That's what they, you know, that's what they told me that you would have to decelerate over time in order to, you know, not go, I guess, through the solar system you were attempting to disembark into. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was driven by the science. Uh, 
But the other thing that I really wanted to do was to make it a very human story because these people are going to be there for a long time and they're going to act like human beings, but they're going to act like human beings in a completely different set of circumstances than any of us have ever faced. Uh, and so you have to imagine some of those things as well and how they're going to interact with one another. And you especially have to imagine some of those things if it happens to be a society unlike your own. And the Buddhist society is unlike our own. Yeah. Well, so tell us also about this. This other story in the book is called The Gospel According to Gamaliel Crucis or The Astrogator's Testimony. Right. Well, that one is one I, I, I wanted to write I think all the way back to when I was in high school. And as I think I mentioned in the afterward to that story, uh, I, when I was attending high school in Santa Clara outside of Seville, Spain, I, I, I took a typing class. Back in those days, if you wanted to be a writer, you had to learn how to type. And I didn't think I could learn how to type, so I took a typing class. Although I had tried, to, I'd done some hunt, hunting and pecking on, a, on an old royal portable Corona typewriter. Uh, but I learned how to type there. But while I was sitting there, I was thinking it would be great if I could write a story in scriptural form because it seemed to me that that was a form that would uh, lend itself to, to storytelling uh, in an easier way than simply writing from scratch. You know, the idea that you could uh, uh, move from verse to chapter, from chapter to book, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, it finally hit me, too, that uh, if you're dealing with uh, a, a savior on Earth, would there not possibly be saviors on other planets if God is indeed attempting to uh, uh, present a message to his or her or its people? Uh, it, it seemed to me that that would, that would happen. And so um, in this particular story, the, uh, the sacred... Uh, savior happens to be uh, an inse insectoid creature, rather like a praying mantis, or, you know, a, a human-sized praying mantis. And uh, that's what the story is about. And it's a satire in some ways, but I didn't intend it to be uh, a satire on religion so much as I did a satire on the way that humans interact with one another, even though uh, we are encouraged by almost every other religion, uh, every religion, not every other, but every religion in some ways to, to get along with each other. Uh, and we don't do that very well. Well, but the story makes a very explicit parallel between the praying mantis eating the body of its mate and the um, Christians eating the body and blood of Christ in the communion ceremony. Uh-huh, that's true. It does. And uh, and I, I've always felt that Christianity, and I'm an adherent, an adherent and, and some people find that hard to understand, but I do believe it's a very strange religion. When you get down and you take a look at some of the, uh, some of the elements of the religion itself and some of the things that we profess to believe. Uh, and so I simply carry that over to what might happen in another uh, society. And as I say in the, in the afterward to, to the story, uh, there were readers of Isaac Asimov's where it first appeared who were very offended by it. And I didn't mean to uh, prompt anybody uh, to, to feel that they, their, their religion was being slighted or that they were in, being insulted, but I did feel that this was an important question to take a look at. And fortunately, Isaac Asimov himself uh, felt the same way and wrote about it. Yeah, I, I thought that, could you, could you elaborate on that? Because I thought that was really interesting. Well, uh, he had these letters that came into the magazine, and uh, he said that there was one gentleman who was especially offended. And he wrote the person back and told him that he felt that uh, uh, in Isaac Asimov's magazine, they did not uh, uh, presume to to publish stories that would offend people, that, but they did feel it was their task to publish serious science fiction. And he called it that. I got it in quotes, serious hmm. science fiction. And that if you were going to do that, you had to face all kinds of issues, especially the issue of religion, which has had such a role in uh, 
the development and the humanity of uh, of the human race. I mean, whatever you say about it, whether you happen to be an adherent or a skeptic or uh, a complete rejecter of the idea of religion, you cannot uh, avoid the fact that it exists and it's something that you're going to have to deal with in some way or other in, in your life here on this planet. And I would imagine on other planets where sentient beings evolve. And so uh, his argument was that I had taken a particular uh, type of religion, Christianity, and I had presumed to uh, extrapolate from it to what might happen if you had a savior on another planet. Now, I'm hardly the first to have done that. In fact, I edited an entire anthology called uh, A Cross of Centuries, and all of the stories in it are about uh, responses to Christianity. And one of the stories is a, a Ray Bradbury story called The Man, who's, and the idea behind that particular story is that a Christ figure uh, is going from world to world to save the people on those worlds, and some people miss him and some people see him, and uh, that's the story that leads off that particular uh, anthology of mine. The final story is called The Cross of Centuries, and it's by Henry Kuttner, and uh, it's a haunting story that I read while I was a teenager, I think, in, a, in an anthology that I believe Frederick Pohl had, had, had edited. And uh, I wanted to get it into the book, but I found a, a number of people who, who wrote uh, stories especially for it or who had stories that worked very well in it, including Jack McDevitt and Jeffrey Ford and Paul DeFilippo and uh, uh, Karen Joy Fowler. Uh, and so to me, this has been a subject that I've been concerned with and interested in for a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, Michael Moorcock's Behold the Man is one that comes to Yes, mind. it's in the book. Yeah, I was very I was very happy and pleased that he allowed me to use that because it's a long story. And anytime you put together an anthology, one of the things you have to worry about is what are people going to want for their stories? And when you've got a very long story, uh, you have to offer them more money than you do for a very short story. And I believe he, he, he allowed me to reprint that for $500, whereas in getting Ray Bradbury's story, I had to pay the same amount for a much much shorter story and uh, and then you're you know you're just it's just part of the logistics of putting together an anthology and part of the finances is is trying to uh, be able to do that but i had a lot of uh, people who were willing to settle for like a hundred dollars for a story just because they felt like it was uh, an anthology they wanted their work to to appear in yeah. I thought it was interesting when you're talking about, you know, you say that Isaac Asimov, in response to this angry letter, that he wrote a very kind of measured diplomatic response. And you say it's a good thing that he wrote it rather than you, because your response would have been more dismissive or confrontational or something. Yeah, I, I see it right in front of me. It says, I was grateful I had not had to write that, that uh, essay or that editorial myself, or I would have most likely met outrage with outrage and self-righteousness with disdain, and that would have undercut one of the points of my long, but less long in this virgin tale, and cursed me with ashes to roll on my tongue. And I, I think that may have been true at that particular time. I think I was maybe a little more of a hothead then than I am now. Uh, and maybe I wouldn't have done that. I don't know. Sometimes when you actually face the situation itself, you, you know, maybe you, maybe you get a better grip on yourself. It's funny because just from talking to you, you seem like the opposite of a hothead. But well, I, I think I have been most of my life, but uh, uh, I have blown up upon occasion. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, hopefully uh, not during this uh, interview. No, no, no. I, I'm enjoying it and. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the fact that you've even uh, approached me about it. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, yeah, like I said, you were one of the first writers I've met, and there's just something mythical, you know, about sort of the first people you meet uh, in, in a field like this. And yeah, so I was, I've been waiting for a while for you to come up, kind of come out with a book so I could talk to you about it. Well, I'm glad I did then. I'm very glad I did. And this is another thing, too, you know, careers have their ups and downs, and, uh, uh, you know, I felt like I went through a period when I was highly in demand for anthology reprints and that sort of thing, and and uh, and people were interested in my books as they came out. Uh, and then, really, I kind of lost my publisher. Uh, you know, they decided they didn't want uh, my my work anymore, 
uh, I think primarily because of the way it was selling or failing to sell. And so, you know, you kind of undergo these these metamorphoses as you as you travel from one stage of your career to another. Even though you may not feel any different internally, you you feel like there's a different perception of you somehow. Uh, and so that's been one thing too. Uh, uh, I, I feel enormous gratitude to Patrick Swenson, who has been behind this uh, project of getting my work back into print, and also of my publishing new work. Because I've done uh, now, I have done three books that are completely new, that are not simply revisions of work that I was doing, you know, to to get older work back into print. Uh, but the thing is, when you do these revisions, it does take away from the time that you could be spending writing new work. And I've had many people tell me they don't understand why I'm doing this. And I think it's because I feel a great deal of attachment to the works that I wrote because I wrote them out of uh, genuine feeling and passion originally, and I hate to see them just disappear. Uh, and I think that I have in many respects uh, – uh, gone back and smoothed out some of the infelicities of style or of uh, structure that existed before. And so I, I'm just enormously grateful to Patrick Swenson. Also, I think he produces really beautiful books, uh, given that you know he is working with uh, uh, a print-on-demand uh, publisher. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Sasser Dodal Al has a limited edition hardcover uh, that is really, really nice. Uh, but I, I also like the trade paperback. What I want to mention too, I you know this other book of yours that came out recently, "Other Arms Reach Out to Me," Georgia stories. I think has a particularly right. striking cover. Well, again, this was this was uh, due to Patrick Swenson. The cover on both of these books uh, are of his design. Now, I'm not going to say that he created or he did the artwork, but he did do the design for both books, and he found. Uh, the uh, the images that you see here online, uh, and um, he found them relatively inexpensively. This is one thing you worry about when you're an independent publishing house. How do you you know how do you get your artwork and how do you make sure it's uh, it it's, comes up to the standards you want it to? And Patrick's decided, well, I'll do it myself, uh, and. Uh, he's done an ex excellent job of that, and he always gives me a chance to to uh, uh, express what I would like to see, and then he goes about realizing it, and I think he does a wonderful job. These are all, for the most part, uh, mainstream stories, stories that I sent to uh, uh, publications that uh, – either accepted both SF-related material and contemporary fiction or, uh, or venues that were primarily for literary fiction uh, or literary essays. You know, one of the stories in here is from the Georgia Review, and, one, and several of them are from the Chattahoochee Review, which is a, uh, a smaller review, a less well-known uh, review here in Georgia. And uh, the editors at that publication have been very good to me and have accepted stories. And uh, um, so I, I feel very good about that. And also uh, the lead story in the book, The Road Leads Back, uh, appeared in an anthology called After O'Connor, and, and of course that's Flannery O'Connor, and they were all stories by uh, Georgians or ex-Georgians uh, uh, that Hugh Ruppersberg, who wrote the introduction to this particular book, my book, Other Arms Reach Out to Me, uh, he uh, he gathered together these stories and he, he used The Road Leads Back uh, in, in his anthology, and I had pretty much written that story for him, I believe. Uh, I have to stop and think and look where they where they first appeared. Well, right. So you pointed out two stories to me that I should check out from this book, The Road Leads Back and um, The Rattlesnakes and Men. And so uh -huh. I read uh, The Road Leads Back, and there was just the part that kind of jumped out at me where the, the main character is a writer. And she thinks, mm -hmm. uh, not many people read the literary journals in which Flora Marie published under the pseudonym F.M. Thorne, and fewer wrote letters to their contributors. The letters that did come sounded like either the praise of doting parents or the ravings of psychopaths. I was just wondering <laughs> how uh, autobiographical that experience is. Well, uh, not, not terribly, I, I would say, you know, but I, I, 
the main character in that story, of course, is a, a Flannery O'Connor analog. Uh, she's a, a stand-in for Flannery O'Connor, and her name is somewhat similar uh, to Flannery O'Connor's. Uh, I have to stop and, and go through these stories, but, I'm, but I, I should have said that The Road Lead Back first appeared in an anthology called, or in a, in a journal called Polyphony. Uh, and uh, um, another story of mine called Baby Love appeared, in, that's in Other Arms, appeared in that anthology too. But what I should have said is that Hugh Ruppersberg picked it up and used it in After O'Connor, after it first appeared in Polyphony. But anyway... Um, the story itself is indeed a, a homage to, to Flannery O'Connor. And uh, um, I really did a lot of research on that one as well. You know, not only am I familiar with her work, I've read everything she's written. Uh, at least I think I have. And that includes her letters and, and uh, uh, articles and that sort of thing. And I taught a class at LaGrange College, which was devoted entirely to her short fiction. And we read all of the short fiction in, in a single volume from the Library of America. So she's a, she's a, a, a genuine influence as well. I mean, I've certainly read, I read some of her short story in, in college, stories in college, but I certainly haven't read all of them. And this story has a sort of supernatural element toward the end. Is that something that would be a no? You would never find her doing that. In fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe that was why this story did not uh, go to the Georgia Review. I, I, I sent it to the Georgia Review, and they kept it a long time, and they talked about it, and they talked about it, and they talked about it. And they even suggested uh, uh, something to me that I did in the story. Uh, they said something about when you've got a gun in the story, it needs to go off. Well, I made the gun go off, and that helped the story in, in numerous ways. But I don't think they could get past the fact that there is this unusual element at the end. And I'm not going to mention it here except to say that uh, it's a fantasy element, and it was deliberate. I did not uh, uh, make a mistake in putting it in. That was part of what I wanted to do in the story. But I still feel like it's a very Flannery O'Connor-ish, despite the fact uh, uh, that uh, the editors at the Georgia Review couldn't go with it, ultimately. Well, because it's a story about seeking miracles, and yeah. I thought it was funny because the, 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 at one point in the story, the characters come across a, a monk who's read uh, one of the characters' stories in the Oki, Oki Finoki Quarterly, and they say, oh, this right. is our first miracle. Right, right. Uh, and I felt like that was uh... – I was kind of proud of that line. I like that. But of course, you know, the epigraph to the story is, I am really only interested in a fiction of miracles, Flannery O'Connor. And so I felt like there had to be a miracle or two in this story. Uh, and in her case, the miracles were usually uh, that a person that you would not expect to change changed, you know. Uh, and uh, because her, her Catholic faith was incredibly strong, and it, and it uh, was the undertext of all of her stories in some way, even when she was dealing uh, with holy rollers and, and Protestant characters that had nothing to do with her faith or knew anything about it, she was still dealing, I think, with her, her Catholic faith and her dramatizations in these stories. And, of course, her most famous story is... Uh, uh, a good man is hard to find, which is about a multiple murder. And many people were just shocked that a, a, a woman of her stature and faith background and uh, ethnicity and, and uh, the state of her origin that she could write something like that. But uh, she was an astonishing writer in that regard. I mean, you said earlier that people are surprised, right, when they find out that you're a Christian. Why do you think they're yeah. surprised? Because uh, many people think that uh, if you're a Christian, you don't think very, uh, what shall I say, realistically about things, uh, that you're not a hard-nosed realist, and that uh, only hard-nosed realists are uh, ultimately to be trusted intellectually. Uh, and I, I really do think that there is that element that exists in a, in a large... And I, now, I don't want to get across the idea that I feel persecuted, because I don't. And I think there are a lot of people of faith who feel like they're being unduly persecuted, and I don't feel that that's the case. But I do feel uh, maybe some of the, the kind of... Uh, and some of the kind of stigma attaches to religion uh, that used to attach and may still attach to, to science fiction in some quarters. And very often they are uh, 
intellectual quarters uh, of society. Uh, so, you know, what can I say? I mean, when you're writing a story um, like uh, uh, The Gospel According to Gamaliel Crucis, how, did you feel like there was any sort of, like, conflict between being a Christian and writing that story? Or that were you aware that other Christians might um, react? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced. You know, I knew that some would not like it, uh, but I didn't feel like there was any conflict in me personally about it, because I don't have any problem uh, um, balancing these particular aspects of, of uh, my personality or my, my, my life. Um, I really don't. And I don't want to sound like I'm protesting too much either. For one thing, I I, I live in a, a small community where this is uh, probably, uh, I would say, you know, a good significant portion of the community attends church on Sunday. Uh, so I don't feel like I'm an outsider in that regard in any way. Uh, but I've sometimes gone into classes. I teach a Sunday school class every Sunday. I've sometimes gone into classes and set forth questions that I think are hard for some of us to talk about. But I've been very pleased by the fact that uh, we can talk about these things in class. Like what What kind of questions? Well, I, I would suppose they are things like uh, uh, race in particular and uh poverty and I try not to stay I try not to jump too much on politics in in that class but I don't uh, I don't uh, put my political opinions aside when I'm I'm talking to friends or to people who ask me about them straight on I try not to bring it up in church because it, it really does irritate some people I mean, you mentioned that the story, the gospel according to Gamaliel Crucis that there was an editor who wanted it for a sort of left-wing a uh, quasi-radical collection. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I would say that probably that was a good thing that that it did not end up there because I, his particular position was, um, you know, I had to tell him. I said, "Look, and you're taking a story from a person who is a believer, okay, and yet you're doing it for a publisher who that." Uh, publishes primarily radical tracts and screeds even to some instance. And I'm not saying that uh, that I don't agree with the politics of some of them because I'm probably uh, a lot more left than any of my my uh, uh, fellows around here. Uh, but I did feel that uh, he was attempting to look at the story as if it were uh, a tract uh, against uh, Christianity. Uh, and, and that's never how I intended it. So ultimately, the fact that it did not get published there was probably a good thing for both of us. I mean, you said that he was looking, he wanted to do four stories like this, and he couldn't find any others, which I thought was interesting. Why do you think that he had trouble finding other quasi-radical... I don't know whether anybody else, you know, is interested in writing about it, although I'll have to confess that I, I go all the way back to uh, uh, to science fiction titles. James Blish's A Case of Conscience is a good example, and in fact, uh, writing as a, a, a critic, and I can't remember the name that he wrote under now. Do you happen to have that under your... <laughs> um... Boy, it's like I can kind Athling. of Athling. William Athling yeah, yeah, Jr. Yeah, yeah. That was that was the name he used to write his criticisms under. But he had one one essay called Cathedrals in Space, which was about uh, religion in science fiction. And I re remember that he gave a great deal of space to James Blish's uh, A Case of Conscience, and that's always a book that I've admired uh, a good bit. It's been a long, long time since I've read it, uh, but I do recall that uh, Mary. Um, Russell, what was her middle name? Yeah, the woman Dorian who wrote Russell. The Sparrow. Mary, Mary Dorian Russell wrote a book called uh, uh, The Sparrow. And in many respects, it was similar to A Case of Conscience. She had a Jesuit priest as its main character. And uh, so, so this is still going on, but it seems to be a, a kind of a, a subgenre of science fiction. Uh, but, I mean, if you take a look at a book like uh, uh, Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, there's a religious aspect to that. And, of course, to 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, so it comes up over and over again. It's just that it's in different permutations than most people are used to, to uh, discussing or talking about religion. 
I mean, I haven't read A Case of Conscience, but the premise, as I understand it, isn't there a, there's a priest and he goes to an alien planet where it's this great society where they have no concept of God and that causes him to have a crisis of faith? At this juncture, as far away from the book as I am, that sounds like you're on track. But I, I would really have to look at it again to tell you if that's exactly what goes on. But I do know he does have a, 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 a case of conscience as a, as a direct result of traveling to this other world that he's supposed to minister to, I think. Hmm. So you said that when you're writing fiction that you tend not to hold back or you don't necessarily hold back on your political views. And so your story, Rattlesnakes and Men definitely seems to fit that bill. Do you want to talk about that story? Well, I'll say it probably uh, came about in large measure because we lost our son at Virginia Tech in 2007 in the shootings there. He was teaching a German class, and uh, he was the first person that the, uh, the shooter took out. Uh, and it's still very hard to talk about. Uh, but, I mean, I had been uh, opposed to... Uh, the, the laxity of some of our gun laws for a long, long time. And that just hardened both my wife and me on that particular point. Uh, and I don't understand people who think that the Second Amendment gives them the right to own any kind of weapon, you know, firearm that they want to. And I don't understand why they don't think that people should be, every person should be background checked. And I don't understand why they don't even think guns should be registered. But I know why they think that, because the NRA tells them that if your gun is registered, it'll they'll be easier to confiscate. And uh, you know, all I can say is that I think that's a paranoia that in many instances has cost many, 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 many people in this country their lives. And so the story is about that, except that I don't address guns in it. I, I substitute rattlesnakes for guns, and that's why it's called Rattlesnakes and Men. So why do you think that rattlesnakes was kind of the metaphor that you chose to go with there? Because I wanted to go some, with, with something that uh, was so ridiculous that people would think, how could people think uh, that people would that anybody would ever agree that you had to own a rattlesnake? Uh and the story is about why these people think you had to own a rattlesnake. In my in my story, guns do not exist, uh, and so rattlesnakes are the equivalent in, uh, of guns in this story. And that's such an absurd analogy to make that uh, I I think it's vivid enough that it makes its point. And so you have the Nakusa Rattlesnake Alliance, which has the yes. Yes. And, uh, of course, I, I have very, very little respect for the NRA, and I know people locally who really dislike me because of that. But I have good reasons for it. It's because I think they fight everything that would make guns, the, the, the availability of guns, uh, dependent upon full background checks without uh, without people who are, are – uh, as they say, law-abiding, that's the term they always use, law-abiding citizens would really not have any trouble continuing to keep to keep guns even under a system of registration. Uh, but it's never going to happen in this country, and it's largely because of the NRA. Well, right. So in the story you talk about, or the, the, the Rattlesnake Alliance is enmeshed with money and local politics and, um, you know, just various forms of corruption – um, mm -hmm. and is sort of influencing public policy in, in, in ways that mirror uh, real you know contemporary politics, like they're trying to get uh, living pit vipers into the public schools and things like that. Right, right. And, and those sound like you know absolutely absurd when you put them in, 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 in that particular term. But uh, uh, when you talk about guns, people are not going to see it that way. Uh, especially if they're a Second Amendment proponent to the extent that they don't think there should be any regulations whatsoever. Uh, and, and yet, it, and the gun industry is the least regulated regulated industry in our country. I mean, you cannot even, uh, there are laws that pro prohibit you from, uh, you know, questioning them, from suing them if something happens. You know, I, I can't think of another in industry that cannot be sued if, if the product is, is liable in some way. And uh, it, it's just it's just absurd. I mean, could you talk more about what your experiences have been? You said you because you've you've talked you've spoken out about this issue, right? And been a bit of an activist, or 
to the extent that we have gone to the Georgia Assembly on three different occasions to uh, to contest uh, laws that would you know make it uh, uh, that would put guns on campus, and they are now on campus, at least state campuses, the universities that are state owned and state run. Uh, people can take guns on them now, uh, and. Private in, in, institutions do not have to allow that, uh, but uh, you know what? What can I say? We go in, and you can see that everybody has their minds made up already. And uh, uh, we have testified, we have talked, uh, we have presented what we believe to be facts. And in many instances, uh, you know, you, you just leave, and you know that the vote's going to go against you. So it's been discouraging in, in many respects. I mean, in the wake of the Parkland shooting, it seems like I saw the the potential for action in a way that I had never seen before in my lifetime. Did you? Me too. Yeah. Me too. And, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that bothers, uh, uh, that disturbs people who have lost someone to gun violence is that uh, is that you hope that perhaps after the gun violence that has taken your loved one, something will change. And it never seems to happen. And I was extremely, extremely proud of all of those young people who who stood up and, and spoke out. And I and I think that there there are a number of people who are running for office now, who are running on the issue of let's let's make our societies safer by instituting some regulations that are um, what not so lax that they permit people who should not have guns to have guns. And that seems to me what everybody should want. A person who shouldn't have a gun shouldn't have a gun. Have you been there was there was a big story as we're recording this where Alex Jones was kicked off a bunch of major social media platforms. Have you been following that? Uh, I think I saw something in the paper about it yesterday, but I you know I, I haven't followed it very closely to tell you the truth. Um, you know, so, so basically, he's been propagating this um, conspiracy theory that the Parkland shooting was fake. Essentially, that the Bereaved parents. It's a are typical all. thing. It's a typical thing. It's exactly what was done to the parents at Sandy Hook. You know, they were all supposed to be fakers. You know, as if it were a moon landing that we had uh, staged. You know, yeah, exactly. You're going. That's what you're going to do with your children. You're going to pretend that they've been killed in a mass shooting. It's insane. And the people who put forward those kinds of things, as far as I'm concerned, are sleaze balls. <laughs> well, how else can I put it? It's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty clear. Are, are you in touch with other parents from from those other shootings? Well, we ha you know we have been in the past. Uh, this past couple of years, we have not been very involved, and that's partly because I've uh, I've uh, had two different cancers over the last two years, and we've been dealing with that. And uh, in fact, I'm on a walker right now, even though I consider myself to be a very healthy person. I, I'm on a walker because I had a sarcoma removed from my right thigh, a big one. And uh, in the healing process, an infection spread to my right femur and compromised the integrity of the bone to, to the extent that if I put my full weight on my right leg, I could break it. And so I'm waiting right now for I've had a clean out surgery that happened in May and uh, I'm waiting right now for uh, the insertion of a pin or a rod or a nail. They call it different things at different times in my right femur so that uh, it will be strong enough to allow me to, to walk again. And uh, uh, I can get around, but I do it in a walker and I don't put my right foot to the floor when I'm when I'm in it. So that's that's kept us out of of uh, some of the things that we've been doing. It's kept us from traveling. It's kept us from uh, uh, from being as as uh, vociferous as we might be about the gun issue. Yeah, well, I mean that's certainly understandable. Um, have you have you been able to to write still, or are you uh, focused on your on your health right now? Well, it's been hard, but I, I, it's funny because over the last three weeks, I've written my first short story in in about two years, you know, first news story. I think my last story that was published was called Gail Strang, and it, and it cropped up in, in uh, um, Asimov's in 2000, 
2017, maybe early in the year, or maybe it was 2016. I can't even remember at this point, but uh, but it feels very good to have written the story again. But I'm working with it like crazy, and it's very political, and it's, and and I don't know whether I'm going to be able to place it anywhere or not. But it does have a a, a fantasy element. Is that something that you? could talk about, or would you rather keep it kind of under wraps? Well, I, you know, I haven't sent it. The only people I've sent it to are people I've sent it to who I'm, I've asked for comments. And uh, I've been fortunate in that I've gotten some good comments back from one of them was a good friend of mine. I've been known since college, Ray Cavender, who lives in North Carolina, and, and I sent it to him. And he had commented on my previous two stories, including Rattlesnakes and Men and, and Gail Strang. And uh, uh, he gave me some 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 uh, good advice and, and suggested some edits that I think are going to be helpful. But I've also sent it off to Gregory Frost and uh, Jack McDevitt and, and uh, Gregory Feely. And uh, I've heard from all of them except one. And so, uh, you know, before I send it out, uh, I, I want to look at all of these these comments that they've made. Uh, but I, again, I'm worried about Jack McDevitt told me he wrote a story that was political and he thought it was going to be an easy sale. You know, it was a science fiction story and, and he told me a little bit about it. He said he couldn't get anybody to touch it. So <laughs> we'll see. I mean, could you say what the political issue is that you're engaging in? <laughs> uh, I can. Uh, it's about our current president. And that's not, and that's not something that publishers are receptive to right now. I guess not. I don't know. You know, I, I can think of uh, one market that might be, but the standards are really high, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can uh, get it past the gate. We'll see. I've got two markets in mind, maybe three. Uh, but I think if I go beyond those, uh, you know, the only thing I can hope for at that point is maybe to put together another story collection, and I think I'd make this story the lead story in it. Uh, you know, even if it had not been published before. You know, you were saying that when you wrote Rattlesnakes and Men that you wanted something that was as absurd as reality, just different. And certainly, uh -huh. I mean, I was looking at YouTube this morning and one of the videos that came up was Omarosa secretly recorded President Donald Trump. And uh -huh. I, just, I keep having these moments of like, this just cannot be real life, you know, uh, even yes. even this far into it. Right. Uh, I mean, it, it, to me, uh, it, we are living through a period of, of genuine absurdity, and uh, uh, I hope we get to the other side without destroying ourselves. <laughs> right. So, so you said you have uh, you have another collection in the works that that story might go into. Well, I mean, I have enough stories to do that, but I would really feel a lot better if I, you know, if I were. If, I would feel a lot better about a, a new collection if I could write a few more stories. Uh, it's not that I couldn't put together a, a collection with stories that have been uncollected before, but I'm not sure that they would be addressing the issues or concerns that I'm, I'm uh, most interested in and most moved to do something with a buy or two, I don't know how to put it. Well, right. And when you mention, you know, hopefully we make it to the other side of this. I mean, most of the stories in this, in um, the Sacerdotal Owl feature some sort of apocalyptic or semi-apocalyptic scenario um, afflicting Earth in the future. Right, right. And, you know, I, I'm ultimately, I, I think I feel more hope than otherwise. I, I think it, it's uh, almost... Uh, uh, sinful not to feel more hope than otherwise, and, and I say that in a in a practical way, not a judgmental way. Um, and I think it's necessary. Uh, I, for, for instance, in uh, the movement for uh, better better control of of firearms in this country, or what should I say, more sensible gun legislation. Uh, I have been struck by how resilient the people are in it, the ones who keep coming back and coming back even when uh, their local uh, elected officials, you know, kind of turn their backs on them. Uh, they still persist. And uh, I think that that persistence is, is going to mean something over the long haul. In the, the gospel, according to Gamaliel Crucis, the, all the major cities have been destroyed and America is just sort of this wasteland of motels and sports stadiums and amusement parks. And I was right. just curious if there was some social commentary there. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Um, uh, you know, it sometimes seems to me that that we're we are so busy amusing ourselves that we don't uh, we don't really look as closely as we should at some of the things that we're doing to ourselves while our while we're being royally amused. And maybe that could even include you know reading stuff. I don't know. So I, I think that's another reason why I'm, I'm concerned that uh, that uh, what I write has some kind of, of connection to the real world, even if it's uh, set on another planet um, or in an alternate reality. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, you have to – what is it? I, I, I think uh, uh, Alice Walker said that uh, activism is the rent we pay for living on this planet, and I kind of agree with that. You know, David, I think I'm going to have to stop at this point. We've got a, uh, something to go to tonight, and I think Jerry needs to get in here where I am. And, and uh, um, if I could halt you at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I was actually on. planning to, to wrap it up there. So uh, so we're all set. Yeah, so um, I'll just say that we've been speaking with Michael Bishop about his recent books, The Sacerdotal Owl and Three Other Long Tales, and Other Arms Reach Out to Me, Georgia Stories. And so, Michael, just really wish you all the best, and thank you so much for taking so much time to talk with me today. Listen, thank you for approaching me to enable me to talk. I appreciate it very much. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Michael Bishop for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Dinja89 in Croatia and Chris Wilson 45 in the UK. Chris Wilson 45 writes, Geek's Guide is by far the best podcast out there. It's informative and entertaining, and most of all, it is there every week come rain or shine, which is the most important thing, in my opinion. Its host, David Bar Kirtley, really knows his stuff and thoroughly researches his topic before it goes out. If you're looking for a science fiction podcast that is above the rest, check this one out. You won't be disappointed. So big thanks again to Chris Wilson 45 for that great review. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening. 